Awesome. So here we are. And I invite you to take over um, the oh, screen. Okay. Okay. And welcome campers. We have James Hung. And he is here this evening to share with us his knowledge and insight on global and local ecology of honeybees. And I'm going to turn it over to you, James. And if you would kindly tell us a little bit about yourself before taking us on this lovely looking PowerPoint ride. We'd love yeah. that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for the introduction, Wendy, and thank you for having me here. I'm James Hung. I um, am currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. Um, but previous to this, um, I was a postdoc in Columbus at the Ohio State University. And prior to that, I did my PhD in San Diego at the University of California, San Diego. So um, California bees and beekeeping is, is uh, close to my heart. So I first got started um, being interested in all insects in general <clears throat> when I was about four um, back in Taiwan. I was in pre-kindergarten class and I uh, had a really strict teacher who um, would put me in timeouts and all sorts of punishment because I had ADHD and couldn't sit still. So my mom transferred me out to uh, a different class with a teacher who was much more understanding. Um, and she sent me outside to uh, look at insects and to report back to um, burn up some of my energy and to create an outlet for uh, my curiosity. So ever since then, I've um, studied both formally and informally um, the, the natural history and ecology of insects. Um, so I, you know, studied insects all throughout high school, studied insects in college, and um, did a senior thesis on California native bees. So that led me to um, pursue graduate school at the University of California, San Diego. And so here I am. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me drink some water. I'm glad that your mom made the decision to pull you out of school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All entomologists across the land are benefiting from it. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> I hope so, yeah, for yeah. sure. Huge yeah. props to both my parents. Uh -huh. who, oh, that's who, um, were, my, were my first <clears throat> research sponsors, mm. uh, research um, assistants, and uh, and research hosts basically they they let me turn our basement into an insect rearing facility and you know bought me all sorts of equipment took me out out on trips to collect insects and visit facilities that rear insects and so on so oh, yeah wonderful. definitely a huge huge amount of input by my parents and they're very happy that I'm doing what I love right now I bet I yeah. bet and and way to do what you love congratulations <laughs> thank you um, so today I'm going to talk about the local and global ecology of honeybees with um, a focus on Southern California, which is kind of the bee fauna that I know best, but much of the material will also be transferable and generalizable to uh, Northern and Central California as well. So um, I'll be showing a lot of pictures and uh, in order to not clog up the presentation with a bunch of copyright me, um, you'll see that uh, there'll be a lot of photos that don't have copyrights. Those are my photos. Okay, so uh, first things first, many of you will probably know that there are currently um, a number of different honeybee species recognized by scientists. The latest number I found is seven recognized species. Today, we're only gonna focus on one. So the other six species are restricted to Asia and the Indian subcontinent. The only species, the Western honeybee, which is also called the European honeybee, um, that we'll focus on um, is the one that has been introduced worldwide as a um, honey-making agent and a pollination agent. So when I say honeybee, I mean Apis mellifera. So um, as many of you will probably know, honeybees are absolutely amazing. Um, they have the ability to make very detailed mental maps of where the resources are. Um, and they have this you know, beautiful dance language to tell their nestmates, which are their sisters, how to get to these resources. They have an amazingly acute sense of time because when they do their waggle dance in their colonies, um, <clears throat> the sun keeps moving through the horizon. So they, they angle their dance with, um, with the angle of the sun through time, even though they're dancing in this dark 
colony with no direct exposure to the sunlight, which is really cool. They have a very sophisticated communication language that includes a stop signal that allows um, individual bees to override the communications of their nestmates when these communications are um, incorrect or bad for the survival of the colony. Um, so as a result, they have you know, this really, really intricate communication system whereby individuals that operate on a set of principles can come together to form a very complex machine um, that comes together into a society that almost has a mind of its own. And as a result, neurobiologists and um, computer scientists are learning from honeybees about how small components that operate on a finite set of rules can come together to create something that seems to have you know, an, an emergent in, uh, intellect to it. And recently I uh, found out that honeybees can count and they actually have the concept of zero, which puts them in a league of um, very, very elite thinkers among the animal kingdom. And if I recall correctly, the honeybee is the only insect member of this club uh, that includes you know, things like chimpanzees and African gray parrots, which are you know, the smartest organisms that um, we know of other than humans right now. Honeybees are also extremely useful, as I'm sure you know. Um, we get wax, we get honey, we get propolis uh, from them. <clears throat> but the most lucrative use for them worldwide right now is pollination. And honeybees, as a super generalist that will uh, pollinate just about any plant that they, they come across that can offer them nectar and flower, they're very, very useful for agriculture because you know worldwide agriculture involves a large diversity of different plant species with different um, flower structures and chemical profiles into flowers. Honeybees are not choosy, they'll go to all of them. They can also be um, packaged up and shipped around in hives. Um, and in, you know, a single hive can house uh, tens of thousands of individual worker bees that once you plop down the hive, they just go out and forage on whatever flowers that are, are nearby. So um, they're incredibly uh, uh, useful for managing mass pollination um, on demand basically. So as a result, they've been uh, transported all throughout the world. And not only are they pretty unpicky, they're pretty decent at what they do as well. So here's some data that, um, that we published um, last year. So I, I got the year wrong on this. This is actually um, 2017. Um, there's a different paper in 2000, from 2018 that I'll discuss later, but basically this um, graph shows that the honeybee is comparable to the average pollinator, whether you're talking about um, plant species growing in nature or crop plants. So um, the mean of honeybees is at about 0 0.98 with 1.0, meaning honeybees are exactly equal to the average of um, the rest of the pollinating community out there. So they're, they're pretty decent at what they do. They're not the best, but they're also not the worst. But as you can see, there's a lot of variability with respect to how good the honeybee is at pollinating any given plant species. And this is a theme that we'll return to a little bit later as well. Okay, so as a result of the global importance of honeybees for agriculture and for um, food security for humans, we have become you know, very obsessed with the health of this single species. <clears throat> Here's some data from the FAO that shows that both in North America and in Europe, the number of managed honeybee colonies has seen a decline over the past few decades. And this decline um, has been attributed to things like um, parasites and pathogens, to the use of new insecticides and fungicides that harm um, colony growth, colony health, as well as to environmental change such as uh, climate warming, which um, could disrupt um, how they survive through the winter, as well as environmental change like um, the decrease of available wildflowers in the landscape that uh, the colonies depend on to, um, to obtain a full complement of the nutrition that they need to have healthy colonies. And um, this issue of the health of honeybees has become such a media sensation that even <clears throat> large mainstream um, mass media has, um, has you know, put out these articles that 
contemplate the possibility of honeybees disappearing from this world. But in order to, to ascertain how true or how plausible that scenario is, we must first um, you know, get some scientific data on this, right? So the first step is to understand that there's a difference between managed honeybees, which are the bees that humans um, keep, which are the bees that the FAO had data on, um, versus honeybees that are not under management by humans that are living freely in the environment. So these are wild honeybees or feral honeybees. Um, they are wild in places where honeybees are native. So these are bees that are you know, living freely in the environment because they belong there, or they're feral in places where honeybees are brought to those places by humans, and then subsequently um, they've kind of run wild. So basically a species that's living freely in the environment that doesn't really, uh, didn't really belong there in the beginning, like European starlings and pigeons in North America. So again, we have pretty good data on um, the health of these managed honeybees, but very, very little is known about how well the global populations of feral or wild honeybees are, are doing. So we set about answering this. So um, the, the basic background we had to work with um, is shown on this map on the top where every little yellow circle um, shows places where researchers have collected um, the Western honeybee Apis mellifera. So as you can see, they have a worldwide distribution right now. And um, this, is, this circle shows where they're actually native. So they have been introduced far beyond their native range and are found basically everywhere where people live and where um, a, an insect species like the honeybee can be expected to make a living. So I gathered a team of scientists um, shown in these portraits below to address um, how abundant honeybees are um, worldwide. So this is what we found. This is, um, this is our paper. Oh, you know what, actually, um, this is a 2018 paper, I'm sorry. <laughs> Earlier I, I said it, the number should be 2017, but no, it's, it's 2018. I'll talk about 2019 paper later. I'm still, I'm living in the wrong year right now, my apologies. <laughs> um, so each of these pie charts shows um, a locality where scientists have documented um, honeybees and, and or non-honeybees visiting uh, communities of wild flowers that are growing in non-managed environments. So basically natural habitats, <clears throat> how abundant are honeybees, how abundant are uh, insects other than honeybees. And again, this is the native range of the honeybee. Um, the brown, brownish color is honeybees, the greenish color is all other um, pollinating insects and other organisms. So uh, right off the bat, you can see that most of these circles have at least some brown on it, uh, which is not surprising given that global distribu uh, distribution map that you saw earlier. Um, so 52 out of the 80 sites that we um, got data from had honeybees. So this, oh, I should mention that this is a meta-analysis. So this is us going into the literature, looking at what other scientists have published and then putting them all together. So overall, we found that 12.5% of all pollinators documented across um, this worldwide data set um, consisted of honeybees. So that's one out of every eight insects or so um, that were visiting flowers observed by scientists across the world was the European or the Western honeybee. And they were among the three most abundant pollinator species detected by scientists in 26 sites. So basically, neatly half of where they occurred, they were one of the most dominant pollinator species. And the places where they didn't occur, um, these pies that did not have any honeybees, they tended to be places where we don't expect honeybees to occur. So, you know, oceanic island that they've never been introduced to, um, or places in the extreme north where honeybees would not be able to survive. Um, the, the little circle in India is a place where um, the European honeybee would be outcompeted by several species of Asian honeybees that, um, that call India their home. So uh, with this data set, we're able to also look at honeybee abundance across natural ecosystems worldwide through time. And this is what we found, that there was no relationship between year of the study and the abundance of the wild honeybees. So um, that really <clears throat> uh, calls into question the 
plausibility of the scenario that Time Magazine uh, puts out there, right? So uh, the honeybees in the wild are are really we're not we're not detecting any evidence that they are um, experiencing recent declines. Um, whereas you know we do know that honeybee keepers are having a lot of issues um, keeping their con uh, their colonies healthy. So may I suggest an alternate title to this um, magazine cover, the, A World Without Beekeepers. Mm. Um, so I showed you that honeybees are abundant in natural ecosystems worldwide, <clears throat> and that matters a lot um, because honeybees, as I mentioned earlier, are super generalists that will collect pollen and nectar from um, a lot of different plant species. In fact, they're the pollinator species that's known to forage on more plant species than any other single pollinator species in the world. Um, so they could potentially pollinate a lot of plants. <clears throat> they could also potentially um, be removing food from a lot of plant species and having an impact on the native uh, pollinators in that way. So with our data, we were able to also get a glimpse of what honeybees are doing um, in, in their eco, local ecosystems with respect to visiting the plants. <clears throat> so this is what we found. Um, so let me just walk through this graph with you. The y-axis here is the proportion of plant species that um, were documented by scientists. Um, so a tall bar means, so for the example, this tall bar means that 70% or so of uh, the plant species that, are, um, that were studied by the scientists had no honeybees to uh, a little less than 10% of their visits accounted for by honeybees. And then, you know, you go across here, the proportion of honeybees increase on those plant species, very few plant species in these categories, and so on. Um, we can return to this graph if anyone has any questions about it. But what we showed is that um, uh, roughly half of the plant species that were studied by scientists had no honeybee visits whatsoever. Um, about 17% of the plant species were dominated by honeybees, so had more than half of their visits accounted for by honeybees. <clears throat> and about 4.5% um, of the plant species had all their visits made up by honeybees. So um, this pattern is interesting and consequential for several reasons. So um, first, the fact that there's no honeybees on 50% um, or 49% half of the plant species that were surveyed means that the honeybee is not the be all and end all of, of pollinators out there. Even though they can pollinate a lot of, of um, plant species in practice, <clears throat> in nature, um, there's a large portion of plant species that do get ignored by them. So <clears throat> if we're thinking about conservation of pollination ecosystem services in nature, we really do need to keep healthy, robust populations of non-honeybee native pollinators out there. On the other hand, these plant species that are dominated by honeybees, um, the 17% of plant species where honeybees make up more than half of the visits, um, something, something fishy is going on there, right? The honeybee is one out of 20,000 bee species in the world. And if you include non-bee pollinators like wasps, flies, butterflies, beetles, moths, um, there's you know, hundreds of thousands more species out there. For a single species to make up 17%, uh, sorry, to make up more than half of the visits in 17% of the plant species out there, um, that's something that's um, very serious, ecologically speaking. So for those plant species that are dominated by honeybees, um, <clears throat> it could be that the honeybees are rescuing them from having no pollinators. If these plant species exist in an environment where native pollinators have been so hammered by human development that um, not many of them are are left to pollinate these plants, or it could be the possibility that honeybees are so aggressively um, removing resources from these plant species that the native pollinators can't cope um, and have to do something else. And those are some data that I'll share with you a little later as well. So now um, zooming in to California. So this little pie chart is San Diego, where I did my thesis. So that's, that's my own data we have uh, about 75% of floral visitors of pollinators basically uh, accounted for by honeybees. So this is, I think, the third highest 
um, ecosystem in the world with respect to honeybee uh, domination um, where honeybees are not native. There's one place in Africa where honeybees are native, where there are more um, honeybees than we, than we do. But this is a very, very high number. And uh, many of you um, who spend time in natural ecosystems will probably have observed something similar, where it seems like everywhere you look, you see honeybees and very little else. So um, this graph that I showed you earlier, where you know most plant species are not pollinated by honeybees, um, you know, some plant species are to varying degrees um, dominated by honeybees. <clears throat> um, this is the, the pattern across the world. In San Diego, as you would imagine, um, having an average honeybee abundance that's six times the global average, you, you would expect this graph to shift to the right, where plant species that are not visited at all by the honeybees are fewer, so roughly only one in five plant species has no honeybee visitation. Um, more than half of the plant species that I studied um, are dominated by honeybees, which you know again makes sense in a place that's so overrun by honeybees. Um, and uh, the plant species that are exclusively visited by honeybees again, you know, kind of stays roughly in line with the global average at about <clears throat> five and a half percent. So you know, in some ways this graph in San Diego makes sense um, compared to the global um, histogram that I showed you earlier. What doesn't make sense if you think about it though, is if honeybees are 75% of all floral visits that we saw in San Diego, and honeybees are generalists that go to just about any plant species that um, offer pollen and nectar, shouldn't we expect honeybees to really pile up at the 75% mark, where you know most plant species are visited um, at a rate of about 75% by honeybees, and you know some variation around that. Why is it that we see this very different distribution from what we would expect if honeybees were just visiting randomly to whatever plant species is out there? So, um, for the next study, um, we used our own data, which um, included information on how abundant the plant species is in the environment to address this question. And as you can see, it's largely the same team of people with, the, with one person switched out. Um, my colleague, Adrian, who did her master's thesis in my lab. Okay, so th this is what we found. We found that plant species that are blooming heavily in the environment tend to be over, over represented with respect to visitation by honeybees. So um, on this axis, as you go to the right, the, plants, the plant gets more and more abundant in the landscape. And then this axis, this uh, y-axis, shows how abundant the pollinator species is. So honeybees are in gray dots and the solid line. All other insects were combined into one single category shown in the y dot and the dotted line. So, um, so as you can see, they have very different slopes as plant abundance increases, or sorry, I should say, as flower abundance increases on a given plant species, honeybees shoot up very quickly, whereas other insects increase a little bit, but not nearly as much as honeybees. So those plant species that are very abundant in the landscape include things like black sage, buckwheat, um, things that um, probably many of you are very familiar with. Things that are rare in the environment that don't get visited a lot by honeybees tend to be um, plant species that put out just a few flowers like these mariposa lilies or um, any other rare plant species that are you know uncommonly found in the environment and if you look at the proportion of visits contributed by honeybees again this shows the same pattern where rare plant species on this side um, these numbers indicate um, orders of magnitude with respect to how abundant the flowers are so plant species that put out, you know, one to 10 flowers or so. Um, honeybees make up very few of the visits. Uh, the visits are dominated by native pollinators, whereas plant species that put out, um, I think it's like 100,000 flowers or more in a one hectare space, overwhelmingly dominated by honeybees. <clears throat> and this makes sense, given that honeybees um, are able to communicate information very well to their nestmates about what plant species are currently profitable in the environment. 
Um, so if they, if they fly into an environment and see, oh, black sage is blooming in high abundance, they will go back home um, and tell their nest mates, come to this location, there's a bunch of black sage blooming and we're gonna have a party on this one plant species. Um, the fact that they can forage over long distances and communicate that information over very long distances also helps them to, be, to come into an environment where, the, where there's a largely blooming plant species and take advantage of that um, while spending a lot less effort exploring these other plant species that um, are not as, abundant, not as abundant and not as rewarding in the landscape. So what does this mean then? for plants and pollinators that share space with the honeybee. So starting with the pollinators, um, well, obviously, um, they're going to have to contend with another player in their environment that is competing for food with them. So the pollinator species that are foraging on the plant species that um, reach the highest abundance in space and in time are the ones that are going to be disproportionately competing with the honeybees who are, uh, like I just showed, um, disproportionately foraging on these plant species that are highly rewarding and profitable. And as you can see in this picture, <clears throat> um, every red arrow points out a pollinator. There's a bunch of pollinators that I didn't have room to put arrows on. Um, the most abundant plant species tend to be the plant species that support both the highest number and the highest diversity of native pollinators. So the fact that honeybees are disproportionately foraging on the most profitable resources means that they are, <clears throat> they are potentially put in conflict with more native pollinator species and a larger number of native pollinators than we would otherwise expect if honeybees are just foraging randomly on whatever they bump into. Um, so this is uh, an ecological phenomenon that um, we had just discovered. Um, published earlier this year that we think scientists really need to look more into with respect to finding out how honeybees are impacting populations of native pollinators in the environment. From the perspective of the plant, again, <clears throat> we, we would then expect that the plant species that are the most abundant in the environment would um, benefit the most from pollination by honeybees, but also potentially suffer the most if the honeybee is a poor pollinator of the plant species. Um, the honeybee could waste pollen, it could displace pollinators that are better than itself, or it could visit flowers so much that the flowers get damaged, which has been shown in some studies. Um, they could also um, mess with the, the evolutionary dynamics of these plant species by um, selecting for um, flower traits, um, nectar chemistry, um, self compatibility levels that um, the, the population of native pollinators would not otherwise have, have selected for, evolutionarily speaking. Um, there's actually very few studies on how honeybees are impacting native plants. So um, we hope with, with this paper that we just published that um, scientists around the world will pay more attention to this topic and will learn more about how honeybees are uh, impacting the plant species in their environment. Okay, so um, a quick summary about the global and local ecology of honeybees from our um, research. So first, the honeybee is the most abundant pollinator in the world, um, much more so than any other single pollinator species when you um, consider just um, a single forager as your unit of abundance. They were present in 52 out of 80 sites worldwide. <clears throat> so basically globally distributed, they average about one out of every eight um, flower visitors in the environment that scientists have documented. And we saw no evidence that wild or feral populations of honeybees are declining recently. So they're doing just fine in, their, uh, in the natural environment where they are not facing the same kinds of pressures that our managed honeybees are facing. We found that honeybees likely perform a very important ecosystem service of pollination where they occur um, in, the, in our natural ecosystems because their pollination effectiveness is com comparable to the average pollinator. So when they're visiting a plant species and taking pollen nectar, on average, you're doing a decent job. We found that they're the sole pollinator or the chief pollinator for many plant species for potentially a diversity of different reasons. Either they're rescuing the plant 
or they're displacing the, the um, pollinator that used to be foraging on the plant. We also found that they cannot perform an adequate ecosystem service all by themselves, given that they're not a common pollinator for most plant species. And also, um, they tend to ignore the, the lesser, uh, less profitable plant species that are rarer in the environment. So somebody else needs to do that job of pollinating the rare plants. We also saw that they have the potential to seriously impact pollination mutualisms by, uh, just by virtue of removing so many natural resources from the environment. So research from a different team <clears throat> that I really look up to recently show that a healthy colony of honeybees over the course of a growing season could remove as much floral resources as would otherwise have gone on to make about 100,000 native pollinators. So that's a single honeybee colony. Um, and we also found that the honeybees can dominate the most profitable plant species, which as I, as I had just discussed, has um, repercussions for both the plants and the pollinators that depend on the plants. So with this in mind, um, I have a few recommendations for um, responsible beekeeping in biodiversity hotspots, of which California is one. So first, don't overstock your honeybee colonies. Um, I think that's a very obvious one. Your honeybees will suffer if you uh, put them uh, in too high a density and they can't find enough floral resources to keep everybody healthy. They will deplete um, flowers in the environment um, to the detriment of the local pollinators. Don't let your bees swarm. Um, California is already filled with feral honeybees. Um, let's, let's try not to um, keep adding <laughs> fuel for the fire. We should also try to avoid habitats with sensitive species, given how good the honeybee is at um, just going in and removing all the, uh, all the resources in the environment. So especially with respect to fragmented habitats, um, the honeybees can move in and out of the fragments of habitats very, very easily. But the, the native pollinators that are restricted to those habitat fragments that can't go elsewhere to look for floral resources uh, could find themselves with nothing to eat if honeybees move in from elsewhere and take all the resources away. Oh, okay, so avoid heavily fragmented habitats. That's uh, something that I just talked about. Um, also, I think it'll be, it'll be beneficial for you as well as for the native um, biota out there um, if beekeepers also participated in um, providing forage for the honeybees um, to minimize conflict between natives and the, the managed bees that are in the landscape. Last, I think it's important for honey beekeepers um, to promote native pollinator conservation and education as um, people who are, I think, uh, closer to pollinator conservation than most other members of the lay public. So the second half of the talk will um, be a crash course on native bees. So um, California has most of the native pollinators that are, that are known in the world. <clears throat> um, so as you know, pollination is about making, um, making gametes from one plant go to another plant to um, produce fertile offspring. So of course, pollination is about the birds and the bees um, and the flies and beetles and butterflies and moths and bats. Uh, I'll focus on bees today because worldwide they are recognized as the most important pollinators for most plant species uh, and especially in temperate environments. Um, just a quick aside, um, these creatures that I show here are all excellent pollinators that pollinate respectively, um, the flowers with respectively different morphologies. But these, um, these organisms all have several things in common. So one, they have, very, uh, they have a high dependence on resources offered by flowers, which means that they'll be spending a lot of time uh, on flowers where they can contact pollen and nectar. Um, they have a very high mobility, which means that they can help flowers that are grown on individuals um, that are separated across large distances in space um, to interact via these pollinators. And they also have very keen senses, which means that they can uh, detect a flower of the same species that they were just on uh, across a very long distance um, and accurately go to that without bumbling around and wasting a lot of their pollen um, crashing through thickets or something. Okay, so um, here are just the faces of 16 native bees that 
uh, were part of my collection as I did my PhD in San Diego. <clears throat> there are about, uh, as I mentioned, 20,000 bee species known in the world right now. Um, and about 1,600 of those um, are thought to occur in California. So you can, as you can see from the faces of these bees in San Diego, even just within you know, a small county, um, there's a very high diversity in how these bees look. And as you may be able to guess, <clears throat> they also lead slightly different lifestyles. So I'll spend the next few minutes just um, quickly going through um, native bee biology. So before that, I'm gonna um, drop a few bombshells. So first, 96% of the bees out there don't make any honey. 97% of bees out there can't be coerced to live in hives. 92% of the bees out there aren't even social. Um, about half of the bees can't sting. And about 13% of the bees don't make an honest living. So that might be a big surprise because we attribute um, the counter of all these statements to, um, to bees as um, I think as private citizens when we think of um, how a bee lives, we think about how a honeybee colony lives, right? Making honey, uh, living in a hive, revolving around a queen, um, aggressively defending their colony by, by stinging intruders. Um, every worker works really, really hard um, to contribute to the growth of the colony at the expense of its own um, vitality. So I'm here to tell you that most native bees do not live like our honeybee. So um, most native bees are ground nesting. So they'll excavate a burrow in the ground uh, where the females will collect pollen and nectar and form this nice pollen ball that's held together with nectar and secretions. And when the egg hatches, um, they are um, they're this little formless maggot, uh, this larva. <clears throat> and um, as form is you know, almost always tied to function, you could look at this bee larva and tell that it has no function. And that's because it is one of the, it leads one of the cushiest lives of any insect baby in the world. <clears throat> it's born in this underground, you know, temperature and humidity controlled chamber, um, no ultraviolet light, no harsh weather, um, no enemies for the most part. And beneath them is this giant food pillow that they could just eat. And it contains everything they need um, to grow up, metamorphose into a pupa, um, which then waits until uh, the season is right, then the bees um, come out of the soil and start this cycle over again. So um, here are just some examples of bee nests that are in the ground. There's a, there are three different little nests with a nickel for scale. Um, bee nests in the ground are incredibly difficult to find um, unless they belong to species that form uh, little turrets like these or um, little piles of soil. So here's the owner of that um, little turret um, cell, uh, sorry, little turret um, burrow. This is the chimney bee, the Daisy australis. So it's a specialist that will only collect pollen from, uh, from cacti. Here is an ultra green sweat bee, Agapostemon texanus. It looks very, very exotic, but it's one of the most common bees in California. And it's a generalist, meaning that it'll collect pollen from a large number of different plant species. And in the world of bees, um, only females work to construct nests and to collect pollen and nectar. So males are basically just a flying pair of, of eyes and reproductive organs, basically. Um, they serve nothing but to mate with females. Um, in, a very, in a very few species, males will defend some territories that allow their females exclusive foraging rights, but by and large, the males are just chasing after females. So um, circled here are the pollen collecting hairs on this bee. It's called the scopa, and here's the close of it. And you can see that on the hind legs, there are some thick um, branching hairs that uh, allow the pollen to adhere. So as you can see on this bee, there's pollen uh, of two different grain sizes. There's some smaller ones here, and there's some larger ones here. Um, and that's common for bees that are generalists that will forage on several different plant species in a single trip. Here's a mining bee, Andrina sferalsi, that is a specialist on the globe mallow. And as you can kind of see, it, this bee, it's red. Bees come in all different colors of the rainbow, including in California. Here's um, Calliopsis zonalis, another mining bee that's a specialist only on mustang mint. 
And here is one of the tiniest bee species in the world, Perdita minima. Um, there are three bees on this photo. And um, those of you who know this plant, this is Euphorbia, um, I think Polycarpa. And um, it uh, is a tiny little sand mat plant that grows like this tall. This tall. <laughs> so as you can imagine, these bees are super tiny. Here's a penny for scale. Um, the only way to see this bee in action is to know uh, where this plant occurs and then get on your hands and knees um, or even on your tummy and watch these plants. Here's a millitid bee, um, thought to be one of the most ancient bee lineages, um, also found um, throughout California. Um, and this uh, image, which I've used in many presentations before, now holds a special place in my heart because it is on the cover of this month's um, ecology journal. So I, I was lucky enough to be selected for uh, the cover photo on this. So I'm very happy about that. Here's a cellophane bee, Calides louisi. Um, and um, it's a ground nester like all the others that I've shown you so far. And it's called a cellophane bee because it secretes a substance that's chemically and structurally very similar to cellophane to coat um, its nest to um, improve the waterproofing of, um, of the nest. And these bees often nest in, <clears throat> in moist um, riverbanks that seasonally flood. So um, this waterproof cellophane lining is, is a, a pretty handy thing for them. Okay, so when bees are not nesting in the soil, most others are nesting in cavities and wood that have been drilled through by beetles. Um, so here's a cross section where the holes were not drilled by beetles, but by human researchers. And you can see on the top here, cells that are uh, nest cells that are made of leaves. In this one, they're made of petals. Some nest cells, uh, depending on the species, could be made with resin or with mud or with uh, plant fuzz, um, which, um, you know, if you think about it, if you are moving into um, a home that's unfurnished, that you have very little control over, then the best thing to do to make it cozy is to bring in your own furniture. So that's what these bees do. Um, the wrapping of leaves and other materials will help the bees, um, will help the, the pollen balls stay intact, um, will divide the cells so that the older larvae don't grow and eat the food of the younger larvae, and to some extent, they'll protect them from, from attack by, uh, by parasites and pathogens. So here's one of these bees that nest in, <clears throat> nest in, um, the, nest in wooden cavities. This is a masked bee. Here's a leafcutter bee, um, often, um, that often colonizes these trap nests if you put them out there. Um, and on this bee, you can see that the pollen collecting structure, the scopa, is on the underside of the abdomen. Um, so all the bees in the megachylid family, except for I think a couple of genera, um, have this common trait of collecting pollen using scopae that are on the underside of their, their abdomen. So I like to joke that in the world of bees, uh, it's the ladies that have hairy legs or hairy bellies. Here's a large carpenter bee, <clears throat> probably one of the more, more familiar species to um, to those who live in California. Um, they're called carpenters because, because they can chew through pretty solid wood to make their nest, and they use the wood shavings as dividers in their nest cells. Um, they sometimes can become pests by chewing through your lawn furniture or your log cabins, but um, they're very good pollinators for a lot of plant species out there. So um, I don't see them as pests but I also don't do a lot of woodcrafting. So. Um, so here's a cross section of a carpenter bee nest. Um, as you can see, the cells are made chronologically. This is the oldest larva that had the least amount of pollen left. And then um, the mother bee had not yet finished this cell when um, the, researcher has, the researcher has collected this nest um, to use as a demonstration in class. So I mentioned that 92% of bees are not social. So all the bees I showed you just now um, are uh, bees that um, do not live in a colony that revolves around a queen. But 8% of bees do um, live in such uh, a familiar uh, colony structure. In, you know, so bees like honeybees, bees like our familiar bumblebees, <clears throat> and also bees like our less familiar um, sweat bees, like this large 
but like this and this tiny little sweat bee, Lasioglossum hichensi, doing what its name uh, namesake suggests it does. It's landing on my finger and licking salty sweat uh, off of my finger. I also mentioned that 50% of bees don't sting, and that's because stinging is the uh, ex exclusive ability of female bees because the stinger is a modified egg laying tube. So um, any male bee you see out there cannot sting you. And uh, beyond uh, male bees, there's also an entire lineage of bees, the stingless bees, which are close relatives of honeybees and bumblebees um, that also cannot sting. So even the females in these species have lost their stingers, um, but these are only found in the tropics. They're, they're really cute and they're very important pollinators in, in rainforesty habitats. I also mentioned that 13% of bees don't make an honest living. Um, what do I mean by that? So here's, an, here's a picture that illustrates that. Um, so these bees live a kleptoparasitic lifestyle. So what that means is that they basically are bee equivalent of cuckoo birds. So the mother um, cuckoo bird, um, as you know, goes and, goes and lays an egg into the nest of a different songbird species and the egg hatches and kicks out the chicks of the other species and the mother and father birds of the other species raise the baby cuckoo. So in cuckoo bees, which are what kleptoparasitic bees are commonly known as, um, the mothers break into uh, the nest of a pollen collecting bee species and um, <clears throat> lays her own egg there. Um, and the egg hatches, sometimes eats the egg of the host, sometimes eats the larva of the host, and then has the pollen ball all to itself. So in this picture, here's a pollen collecting bee who is forcibly ejecting this um, cuckoo bee from her nest. So, you know, kleptoparasites don't have to spend the energy to dig a nest, don't have to um, risk um, being exposed to predators when they make multiple trips back and forth between flowers and their nest, but they do risk these antagonistic encounters with the host bees whose nest they're breaking into. So um, here's another cuckoo bee, the Zeromelecta uh, larii in Enza Borrego Desert. Um, and as you can see, this insect probably looks very strange to you. And um, that would be because she's missing her antennae, which most likely she lost when she was being um, escorted off the premises by the host bee whose nest she invaded. Here's another cuckoo bee, Nomada. Um, because these bees don't have to collect pollen and they also don't have to make nests, um, they, they uh, don't need to have the body structure um, that most other bees who do engage in these activities have. So they look very waspy, and in my opinion, they look kind of evil. So you can see this one is like rubbing its hands, plotting something um, up to no good. So it'll take a long time for me to um, tell you about the biology, ecology, distribution, and um, special abilities of um, all the different bees we have in California. Um, so I won't show you any more pictures uh, from here, but I, I do want to encourage you to go out and um, enjoy the diverse bee fauna that are, that's available in California. I think, I think it's a very fun thing to do. Bees are absolutely gorgeous um, and they occur basically anywhere that there are wildflowers growing. So um, now is the time, you know, um, between April and June is uh, the best bee watching season in California. So hopefully many of you will have the opportunity to go and enjoy these uh, wonderful organisms. So remember earlier I shared with you that, um, that there are a bunch of different threats to our managed honeybee populations. There are also threats to our native bee populations as well. But the primary one is the conversion of habitat that looks like this to habitat that looks like this. Um, the loss of natural habitat converting into um, urban landscapes or agricultural landscapes is, is the worst thing that has been happening to our native pollinators. And now, uh, while um, this conversion of natural to man-made landscapes is largely irreversible, at least on the short time scale, there are some, some things that we can do to ameliorate the negative impacts on our native bees. So first, we can increase food resources in urban environments um, just by planting flowers, by <clears throat> enlarging uh, or enhancing the parks that we have. Um, so there are a large number of studies now that have shown that 
if we increase the abundance of food resources in, in cities, we could potentially um, enhance the populations of native bees um, in the environment. We should also rethink lawns, I think. So um, I, I enjoy lawns. My son, who's in this picture, enjoys picking dandelions and rolling in the grass. Um, but um, lawns are incredibly unproductive from the perspective of native bees because they don't support a lot of flowering plants. Um, and also, uh, they tend to require a lot of chemical inputs in order to, um, to be kept free of pests and diseases. So studies have shown that um, if we remove lawns and instead uh, plant wildflowers um, that you know, provide food for the bees and that require less um, chemical input, this could be very good for our native pollinators. And with respect to um, adding flower resources in the landscape, um, what to put in place instead of lawns, the Xerxes Society, as well as lots of other um, uh, national and local organizations, such as the California Native Plant Society, um, will be able to provide a lot of great resources and ideas with respect to how to go about these activities. And lastly, um, support your natural reserves and parks, um, both at the, the local level and at the provincial or, or national level. Um, these places are going to be the last strongholds of plant and pollinator diversity, and they're only going to remain strongholds of um, biodiversity if, if we continue to find um, intrinsic value in them, because otherwise they're just going to be turned into whatever um, the highest bidder wants them to turn into. Um, I'm sure you've heard it said that in the end, we only protect what we love. I'd like to add another layer to that, um, which is we can only love what we know. So um, this is why I believe educating people about um, native pollinators and plants and the importance they, they have for our ecosystem is so important. So when you get the chance, you know, go and enjoy these natural areas. Um, take your friends, uh, tell them about how cool bees are, both honeybees and our native bees. Um, and hopefully um, they and our, our, our children and our children's children will continue to find it important to keep these natural areas um, as pristine as they can. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the people and agencies that have made all this work um, that I presented possible. I'd also like to thank um, UC's ANR for uh, hosting this talk. Also, uh, all the data providers um, whose um, probably thousands of hours um, collectively of work have made it possible for me to show you that map with all the pie charts. Um, and these people all generously either provided data um, uh, free for anybody to use, or uh, they send me the data when I sent an email to them to request it. So I'm very grateful for these people. And lastly, thank you for being here today. Um, hopefully um, through this you have um, now a newfound appreciation for our native pollinators. I hope you also can breathe a sigh of relief if you've been concerned about uh, the conservation status of our little friends, the honeybees. Um, so I hope you all uh, go out and enjoy our native pollinators and I hope um, you'll have many years of uh, enjoying your beekeeping activities responsibly, of course. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, James. Big yeah. round of applause to you. High fives and props. And I want that bumper sticker. <laughs> yes. I think that's you are free awesome. to print it out. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, what was the biggest surprise for you throughout your, your study of, of what you just shared with us? What? I think I was surprised at how <clears throat> globally prominent honeybees were. Mm -hmm. um, I guess before that, I was surprised at how, how prevalent honeybees were in the biodiversity hotspot that is San Diego. Mm -hmm. So what I didn't tell you is that out of the 1,600 bee species that are known through, uh, in California, San Diego has about 700 of them. Um, <clears throat> so for a small county on the edge of the, uh, you know, of the, of the, the state to have 700 native bee species 
<clears throat> you know, it's, it's a very special place. Um, and for that very special place to be um, so overrun by honeybees, um, that was a surprise. So in the beginning, I was just like, oh, there's a lot of honeybees. And then when we went, actually went to, to and quantified it and found that three out of four insects pollinating these plants, you know, in large natural reserves were honeybees. Like that was, that was a shocker. Um, and um, yeah, I think that was probably the biggest, the biggest one for us. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. My understanding is there are approximately between 300 and 350 native bee species in Yolo County around mm -hmm. Davis. Mm -hmm. And then when you compare that to the 700 species in San Diego, that's unbelievable. Uh, considering there's 1,600 right. various species throughout the state, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, John uh, sent a chat. He says, incredible pictures. Love the one with the 16 bee faces. <laughs> yeah. That's actually my most, most popular academic product. Um, right now. So I, I have a poster that has, I think, 20, 20 odd bee faces on it. Um, and uh, I've made it available to, to any conservation agency that has asked me for it. So I can send you, uh, Wendy, a, uh, a copy of it and you can distribute it freely. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have unmuted the participants, so if anybody would like to ask James a question, I invite you. I have a question for James. Hi. This is Mary Ellen. Hi, James. Um, I'm wondering where is the best collection? Collection of bees? Collection, yep, of bees, like native pollinators and, you know, the, I'm thinking that it would probably would be the bees that are on pins somewhere. Yes, uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> there are several. Uh, the American Museum of Natural History has a bunch. Is that um, in Chicago? The one in uh, New York. New York, okay. Um, the Smithsonian has a bunch. And actually, <laughs> sad story, um, the USDA has a, has a um, bee biology and systematics laboratory. And uh, currently, their bee collection has been temporarily shut down because the building that they were housed in has to be renovated and somehow the government wasn't able to figure out like where to move all these things into an operationally functional space where the researchers can continue to work on them. So, so I think what happened is that they just all got like condensed and put into a, a like a storage space and the researchers can't access them for a while. Um, I would also like to comment that um, one of the resources that the master beekeepers, um, the Hagen Dawes Honeybee, um, and they have an online um, website mm -hmm. that's really good for uh, looking for plants for bees, and that's at um, beegarden.ucdavis.edu. Oh, so. cool. That's fantastic. James, this uh -huh. is Joan. And um, I really enjoyed the presentation a Thank lot. You. So I go down to San Diego quite a bit and out to Borrego Springs. So that was fun to see that one little tiny bee. Um, <laughs> hopefully I'll get to see that in person. Yeah. Um, but my question is regarding the insurgence of the more aggressive bees, like the Africanized bees in the San Diego area. Mm -hmm. Did you find that that affected the native bee colonies at all? Yeah, so um, Africanized bees. With respect to pollination and how bees interact <clears throat> with other organisms on flowers, I think the Africanized bee, so far, as far as I've learned, um, does not really behave too differently from the European honeybee that was introduced to California in the 1800s. Um, they are a lot more aggressive towards humans, though. Um, but the other thing I found is that I think through, <clears throat> through the years of um, these Africanized bees um, breeding with resident populations of you know, European strain honeybees that were here before them, um, they've lost some of their aggressiveness. So for a project... I helped a friend um, 
in his master's thesis to go and collect uh, Africanized bees from the entrances of their colonies that are in the wild. Um, so of course I had to, you know, wear a bee mask and like extend my net to as long as I can handle it. And, like, you know, catch a bee, run away um, while they get mad and stuff. Um, I think if I were to have done this on fully Africanized colonies, um, I would, I would have gotten stung, but I, I did this for 10 colonies and did not get stung, you know, even once. So um, I think uh, some of the, some of the, the very high levels of aggression have, have uh, been bred out somewhat by, by uh, breeding with the, the milder European strains that are in our, uh, in our environment. And then with respect to how they're impacting native bees, so that the bees are not honeybees, it's hard to tell. So Africanization certainly, I think, has increased the proportion of honeybees in the environment because you know these Africanized bees are better at surviving, um, surviving the warm temperatures, and you know there's some evidence that they might be better at dealing with the pass uh, pathogens and parasites um, that have spread also to California. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have any data on what native bee populations were like before the honeybees were introduced. So we just don't have a baseline. You know, it could be that for every honeybee that I saw in my study, there used to be, you know, three native bees that I would have detected if honeybees weren't in the environment. Um, or it could be not the case. And, you know, that's something that, um, that researchers um, like my team lament, that we don't have a good baseline for what our ecosystem would have looked like without honeybees. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I missed the memo. I didn't realize that honeybees could identify zero and count. So. That, was, that was very recent. That was like wow. last, last year or the year before that. Yeah. I, yeah. I missed the memo. I forgot it. I read it. I don't know. But that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it is really cool. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else have any questions for James? I will. <clears throat> this is Song Lee. I have one Hi. question. Uh -huh. uh, just like in the nature, there's a lot of, uh, and I grow orchids, and then you see a lot of uh, nat natural hybrids and so forth. Do you see any kind of hybrids, uh, like a crossbreeding between the different uh, native bees at all? Oh, that's also a very good question. Um, there is some evidence that certain <clears throat> native bees could potentially hybridize, um, but um, I am not an expert in this field. What I do know is that um, there are some native bee species that are indistinguishable uh, morphologically, and you, you can't tell them apart unless you um, do a DNA analysis. So what that suggests is um, potentially, you know, uh, a species that's still in the process of becoming two clean species. So, um, so yeah, hybridization probably does still occur, um, but you know, it's not as dramatic mm -hmm. as you can see for larger animals because a lot of times, for bees, even cleanly separated species, like you look at them under the microscope and it's a difference of like, this one has two more hairs in this area than this other one. So if they, if they form a hybrid, like it would look just like either of the parent species that already look the same. So, um, so that's wow. my answer. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you. And I certainly, I've been concentrating on honeybees, but now you uh, uh, opened my eyes looking at different type of, I've been, I have been ignoring, mm -hmm. but I, now I'm going to look at them. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank I hope you. you have a lot of fun looking at them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> We hear all the time, everybody repeats the little um, phrase that one of every three bites of food, or is it two of every three bites of food? I get so frustrated with that, um, the inexactness of that um, mm -hmm. phrase. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, so um, one out of three bites of food, there's, it really depends on how you calculate that, right? And it really depends on what your diet is, like what part of the world you're from. Um, you know, because right now, um, 
the, the majority of human calories come from these wind pollinated plants <clears throat> like corn uh, and wheat um, and rice. Um, but there are also a lot of uh, plant species uh, where pollination is an important step, uh, not necessarily for, for making the fruits but, or, or, the, or the edible parts, but at least for the breeding of the species. Right. And um, in this calculation that people like to, you know, like one out of every three bites um, is also the fact that um, clover, which is uh, a major source of, um, of the calories for the, the livestock that we that we like to eat, um, requires bee pollination. So so you're absolutely right. This metric is very inexact. Um, there are also people who um, say, you know, oh, the majority of human human nutrition comes from bees and uh, when they say this they mean that you know a lot of the, the micronutrients in um, that we need to trace amounts that are found in this this fruit or that fruit or you know this this green leafy vegetable or something like that um, the diversity of the nutrients that we need come from a wide complement of insect pollinated uh, plants right so so my my take on this is that you know people can people can uh, can cut the pie how they want. They can they could do whatever calculations they like, um, whether it's one in three bites, one in six bites, one in ten. Um, the bottom line is that is that insect pollination is contributing a huge huge part to human nutrition, um, both at the macronutrient level and at the micronutrient level. Um, worldwide, no matter what region of the world you live in. Some places a little bit more, some places a little bit less. Um, you know, so, um, so the exact figure doesn't really matter um, because, you know, unless you are, say, an Inuit people um, that survive on, on salmon and seal blubber, uh, you're going to want to pay a lot of attention to the welfare of both managed and non-managed pollinators, because research shows that you know even in systems that that people think of as being largely pollinated by these managed honeybees, um, native insects are having a very important contribution as well. Um, so, so people are definitely, you know, even agriculturists in fields that are uh, traditionally dominated by honeybee uh, pollination contracts, they're paying a lot more attention to the welfare. Um, and health of native pollinators now too. Does that answer your question? I, I didn't. Thank you yeah, I did, didn't answer any. I mean, didn't give you any more precise measures, but hopefully, it puts things into perspective. Right. It gives a little more thought to the to the to the phrase rather than just blurping out one in three bites. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I yeah. I should mention too that, that though that uh, one of the most prominent bee researchers in Canada, um, a professor at Guelph. Um, his website is one in three bites dot org. So, you know, if it's good enough for Nigel Rain, it's good enough for me as a as a very sure, rough it estimate. Gives people something to kind of focus in on. Yeah, exactly. And I think our diet would be almost completely depleted of color. If yes, it, if that, it were. that is very true. Yeah. Yeah. Bees, yeah. yeah. Bee pollinated things add a lot of color. Yeah. We'd yeah. be eating Cheerios or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for James? One more. Let's give him one more. And if there aren't, we'll sign off. As it is, uh, my goodness, after 11 p.m. in Toronto. So um, I must say I'm grateful. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. And... Um, the California Master Beekeeper Program thanks you. You have provided us with a touchstone from which we can advance our native bee curriculum, mm -hmm. thanks well, to your research. And it's really, really important mm -hmm. research. Yes, yeah. So any journey level folks on the webinar, please take note of not only the, the amazing pictures, but also the the incredible insight and and research that is offered by james for which we are grateful thank you thank you thank you and we will definitely be in contact uh, again soon yeah please let me know uh, if, if you know other 
um, participants of the webinar who couldn't make it today who are watching recordings. Um, if they have any questions, um, please direct them to me. My email is at the bottom of, of the slide. So see they that can, they can get in touch with me whenever. Um, and just as, just as a parting thought, you know, um, in, in my field of academia, there's often this like antagonism against honeybees and against beekeepers, right? There's like kind of an academic purism to say, oh, like, you know, we only care about the native pollinators. The honeybees are just pillaging marauders who are like messing <laughs> everything up. To some extent, you know, that, that does bear out ecologically. And it is, it is an issue that, um, that ecologists need to contend with. Um, but sometimes, you know, this, this sentiment bleeds out to onto beekeepers, um, both major apiarists and, you know, urban beekeepers and hobbyists. <clears throat> and, I, and I'm more and more realizing that, you know, this doesn't need to be the case. And, you know, some of my colleagues are, are, are pointing people um, also to the fact that uh, beekeepers and, cons and native pollinator conservationist goals are, are largely aligned in, in many ways, right? Um, both honeybees and native pollinators suffer from climate change. We both suffer um, when uh, there is unchecked use of, of pesticides at the landscape scale. We both suffer when um, wildflower patches or even weedy flower patches uh, get turned into impervious cover or crops. Um, we both suffer when, when there's unchecked trafficking of, of pathogens and, and diseases. Um, by whatever um, agent of, of uh, transfer. So really there's a lot of opportunities for beekeepers and conservationists to work together to, um, to ensure that the environment that, um, that is shared you know, between uh, keeping healthy honeybees and keeping healthy native pollinators will, will remain in the top shape for both of these groups. So there's a lot of, uh, of opportunities for these for these two groups to uh, to join hands, and I think there's a lot of opportunities for um, for beekeepers to to count themselves among those who are fighting for a better uh, better future for native pollinator conservation as well. So, um, agreed. Yeah. So that's mm. that's my my parting thought for the day. Yeah, great thoughts. And if you um, would be so kind as to send us maybe one or two recent papers that outline pests uh, uh, or parasites and pathogens that uh, say the top couple within native pea populations in California, that we'd appreciate that mm. as well. Uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not really well plugged into the, to that literature. Mm -hmm. um, I think like people like you know, Alina Nino and or Neil, uh, and Neil I could ask Williams. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they'll, yeah, they'll know more. Yeah, um, okay. Because that, that was a question that I forgot to ask, actually, but obviously yeah. it's relative to the health <laughs> and sustainability of the native population as well, just as it is with honeybees and varroa and the mm -hmm. uh, pathogens and viruses that exist within honeybee populations. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, go bees. Thank you. And please thank your parents on our behalf. Okay, <laughs> okay I will do that. <laughs> on behalf of the California email. Master Beekeeper Program, uh -huh. thank you to your parents. Yes, okay. and thank you. I will you send them you. an email right after this. I appreciate that. We'll yeah. be in touch, James. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.